offering you a unique experience, namely about the situation in Europe. We'll talk people who are related to Europe, who come from Europe and who have a bit different take on it than usually the American audience has. And our first speaker is uh, Ms. Uh, Orsolia Bujas, who was born in Hungary. And uh, she studied, uh, she studies national security and statecraft at IWP, of which we are very happy. Mm -hmm. She also graduated from George Mason University and uh, de Vos Laurent University in Budapest. Uh, she is interested in uh, Europe and in the democratic transition um, in the uh, in the post-Soviet states, as well as she's an expert on the situation in Hungary. So please, uh, let's listen to the lecture on conservatism or right-wing populism, which refers to Hungary. Uh, the lecture is going to take 30 minutes, then we'll have 15 minutes for questions. Thank you so much, Ms. Bojas. <laughs> Well, good, good afternoon, and thank you for allowing me to share my research with you today. Uh, the direction that I'll be going in today is actually somewhat new to me because I'm used to taking on the post-communist transition more of an economic dimension. But in light of recent developments uh, in Hungary and growing opposition to the ruling party, I decided to pivot more towards the political uh, philosophy and the ideology of not just Fidesz, the ruling party, but also the political arena of the uh, of post-communist uh, Hungary, and the process by which the competing ideologies have shaped each other uh, comparatively, and also how they shape themselves within the framework of the post-communist legacy. Some of the buzzwords that I've heard a lot were populism, right-wing conservatism, right-wing extremism, and other uh, keywords. So I wanted to unpack these ideas. Um, and uh, starting with the first democratically elected government and the factors that created the political space in which uh, Fidesz operates in today. And some of these, where th some of these competing ideologies come from. So the, my, uh, thought process, like I mentioned, will be to examine the first political uh, democratic, um, democratic elections of Hungary and see um, how the winners, the winner co coalition um, has carried on, has first established the conservative legacy in those four years, uh, how the opposition party and opposition ideologies re reacted to that, um, some of the challenges of conservatism uh, over the years, uh, and then finally going into more contemporary rise of the Orban Fidesz uh, party, um, and then unpacking finally these buzzwords of, of what is the Hungarian brand of populism or conservatism, or what are the elements that, um, that are used. Um, and then dabbling into politics and ep economics, because um, that is uh, from my previous research, and then what are the contributing factors that are creating this arena? What is Fidesz, the ruling party, has to react to, let it be the European integration or, um, uh, or ethnic issues in the country? So this is the, the, the thought process I'll be, um, I'll be uh, presenting in. So this is the, the party politics, the landscape of the first um, election, the competing ideologies that you see. Um, and due to the specific legacy of the communist era, um, the, much of the institutions were preserved. So keep in mind that a lot of these inherited the landscape of the, the, of the post-communist state. Um, you have the alliance of the Free Democrats, which is um, the successor of the cosmopolitan urbanist um, of the interwar period. You have the Hungarian Democratic uh, Forum, uh, which uh, stressed a kind of a, a third way, um, third way of going into the future, somewhere between socialism and capitalism, and then you have the Hungarian Socialist uh, Party, uh, which is the successor to the Hungarian Communist Party, which represents the left, uh, left side of the spectrum, political spectrum. You have the Alliance of Young Democrats, the Fidesz, which is the ruling party today, and then uh, the rebirth of a few uh, historical right-wing parties. Um, it was the the uh, the victor uh, of this um, election was the winning coalition Democratic Forum, with uh, uh, in the coalition with the Small Hoarders Party and the Christian Democratic Party. So the challenges of conservatism in Hungary, since uh, uh, the 
much of the there was not much of a historical tradition uh, of conservatism in Hungary uh, like it is in the United States. The earliest time would be the interwar period, uh, which had a lot of authoritarian characteristics that weren't just not compatible. They not did not they did not give answers that politicians needed in the turn of the century. Um, since uh, the the politicians who want to keep the status quo, those who um, turned their pre-1989 uh, political capital into economic capital and wish to seize control or remain control, wanted to keep the status quo. So a lot of conservative, um, ideologically minded people had to stay in the, uh, in the radical field. Um, the democratic institutions and market economy, whereas there was a formal transition, uh, some of these liberties, much of them were not redistributed to the people, so they could not be mobilized in the same way as here, where you could say, you know, um, bring forth more political liberties or, or so of civic engagement, because such a redistribution did not happen. Uh, and some of the, the cleavages uh, that to, had to respond to the dichotomies in, in society at the time, the, the regime divide, the, the difference between should we keep the old system or the, the new one, the economic distributive divide between um, a free economy or more government uh, intervention. Um, but the most the prominent ones that uh, the conservatives had to respond to uh, because of the national accommodative mo communism of the Kadar era were the social cultural divide uh, and the national cosmopolitan divide about national identity or internationalism. So what are the, uh, some of the conservative legacies or the legacies of the, this first uh, winning coalition? The uh, Josef Antal, who was the um, the uh, leader of this party, definitely believed in limited style of politics. He wanted more of a um, middle of the way road uh, to bring coalition between people. There was no need for radicalization in the birth of the first uh, democratically elected party. Uh, and this, this restricted claim on both the state and society, mostly emphasis on rule of law, is very in contrast to populist ideology of um, trusting in the masses and, and giving um, trusting in the, in the masses that whatever they say is, after all, better for, um, for the system. So this Hungarian variant of, of conservatism found it natural to adapt uh, national history, which is why he emphasized that relying on historical heritage in co instead of coping um, other examples of, uh, of transition. Hungary should be compared to Hungary itself as it was in the past in its transition, reaching back to some of its heritage as opposed to uh, the democratic transition in other satellite states or even comparing itself to um, non-satellite states in the West. However, it must be noted that there was no such reliance, the over-reliance on ethnic heritage or historical heritage that much. Antal definitely uh, reaffirmed the commitment to the nation as it must be reconciled with political democracy and more of a civic uh, citizenship as a looking at the state in the civic account as opposed to the cultural account. Because he could have looked at it in two ways. Um, cultural account where you stress the pre-political existence of a nation where you are collectively together in language, culture, symbolism and history. However, while stressing national uh, heritage to move forward, he chose a civic account of, of the nation which emphasizes the shared civic culture, the uh, allegiance to common institutions, the state patriotism, which allows more inclusivity um, to, to people who want to belong to Hungary. So his conception was definitely, uh, did not exclude anyone who wished to belong to this community. He actually said himself that virtue, reason, command, fate, intention, and opportunity are the ways uh, the made, uh, made Hungarians. This is the way that we comprehend the meaning of the Hungarian nation as a spiritual and cultural community open to all who want to join. He, his statement clearly concedes that uh, national history uh, is embedded in its historical values, but national identity, which is separate from that, is a social function. I'm stressing a lot of these because you see contrast with the first, the legacy of the first uh, administration compared to how the ruling administration sees the nation today, whereas uh, I identify a lot more cultural, um, 
the cultural context of the state as opposed to the civic context of the state, which has created more tension both in the European integration and also in domestic politics. Um, to now turning more towards the um, economic, um, the approach uh, that the first uh, administration it wanted to wear away from the shock therapy that was recommended by most Western states because uh, it would be politically risky. They wanted more of a, a gradual integration. Um, this this uh, cautious uh, attitude, not wanting to risk it more politically or economically to jump into shock therapy, you, I'll also demonstrate in confronting the past by opening the secret police files, being moving really cautiously, not wanting to create too much political risk. So on the, on the market side, on the political approach of the economy, it was definitely uh, more gradual, rejecting the shock therapy. And finally, another um, legacy of this administration since the, the coalition was in part the Christian Democratic Coalition, uh, which, I, which I found interesting in 1990, the stress on European integration uh, because as they said and we accept the common European political heritage and moral values um, making it another distinction between the ruling party today that on a moral basis European integration did fit in this um, in this moving forward now it wasn't as complicated with the cultural or top-down global governance but on the moral basis and the value basis this was like I said stressed in 1990 so from this, from this um, legacy, moving on to the rise of Fidesz, as we knew it back then. In 1994, after the first, um, first administration, the Socialist Party had a landslide victory. This reflected the dissatisfaction of the people with the way the first administration handled uh, the transition. The, um, there was, like I said, economic dissatisfaction. Um, and this landslide victory showed the consequences of the post-communist uh, structure that was still alive that just did not consolidate with many of the um, progressive ideas that would move forward. To, so um, now in, from 1994 to 1998, we're in a socialist era um, where a lot of um, neoliberal economic ideas were introduced, including the Bokros package. To prevent the threat of national uh, bankruptcy, a lot of very unpopular economic policies were uh, introduced, including uh, the devaluation of the 14th, uh, the introduction of tuition payments, which were not common in a market economy, uh, um, plant economy, as well as the, de uh, decl uh, the decline of the real value of wages because they increased in a slower rate than inflation did. So as I said, these were very unpopular amongst the people. But I do have to note that while unpopular, because nobody really enjoys austerity measures or being having less real um, wages, there was uh, the Hungarian ec economy really experienced a revival between uh, 97 and 2000, and the growth rate was well above uh, 5%. It was just very unpopular. So following this, um, so, so um, like, uh, like I said, it, this was a, a socialist from 94 to 98, socialist government. And really, Fidesz, from this point, uh, still was a, a liberal opposition party, but then its ideology started pivoting more to a conservatism. Um, in my opinion, it was really just ad adapting to the changing political environment, because now it could settle into um, an anti-communist rhetoric by being an opposition party and taking on really whatever is the opposite of the, what the other party was saying. While op an opposition party, it recognized that the conservative, uh, the conservatism of the first um, coalition was not as popular and they needed to attract a mainstream electorate, thereby bringing in more um, ideologies and ca kind of casting their net more widely. This is how I saw the development of um, populist conservatism or mobilizing conservatism, bringing in other, other ideas to, like I said, get a, a larger electorate. Now moving on to what are actually these terms, how they were signified or how they were used. As I mentioned here that it was more of a political style rather than a shared ideology, which you will see how the elements are interchangeable and how they use sometimes. Some statements made here in the late 1990s are not applicable to the, the um, 
ideological spectrum of what Fidesz leads today. So whereas populism finds two antagonistic groups between the people and the elite and might uh, need elements to mobilize people, the difference between that of a populist radical right party and uh, mobilizing conservatives is definitely the question of nativism, where you have to believe that the state should be inhabited mostly by native people. This ideology is not uh, a core ideology, core element of the conservative value system at all. So this is something where you couldn't consolidate the two. So to clarify, populist radical right is a, is a special different kind of nationalism. However, nationalists are not necessarily popu uh, populist radical rightist. So this is when you can start projecting some recent developments at this point of the ideological, ideological development of the right as well as Fidesz uh, in specifically where conservative populist movements are not anti-democratic. After all, they are, represent the people against the elite. However, they are anti-liberal, which gives them more flexibility to break with the procedures of a constitutional or procedural representative democracy. This is how you can see a very expedited law uh, targeted to an international university that passed within um, a lot shorter time with a lot shorter time to debate then you would expect a more constitutional representative democracy or some shortcuts might be taken that are not as traditional or um, not as to our palettes here um, as it is there. So we're continuing on with the ideological development of Fidesz and the right and the still this flexibility since it doesn't fall into a certain specific party ideology, but rather taking elements, it gives it a lot of flexibility, thereby reigniting the antagonism of ex-communist elite. Like I said, it fell into this opposition party, this opposition rhetoric that it can settle into. So now it could just attack anything that's status quo and brand it with post-communist left, creating this dichotomy where it's always either this way or that way. So as we were, uh, but to prevent sounding too radical right, uh, very nicely there was the Hungarian Justice and Life Party, which sort of outbid Fidesz in ethno-radical language to the, of the extreme right, making Fidesz a lot more palatable and making it more palatable to the mainstream, keeping it with its larger electorate without seeming too radical. So I said, uh, after the, the loss of the 2002 elections as a socialist, then we go back again to the uh, Fidesz as an opposition party. We're now, again, we're pivoting and uh, crystallizing the ideology, political ideology, and bringing it, Fidesz, almost to a spiritual level as we see uh, Viktor Orban's speeches as it goes on. It makes a lot of arguments on dichotomies like chaos and harmony, good and evil, creation and destruction, creating a sense of democracy, um, moral, pulling politics on a moral realm and addressing Fidesz as the guider of these, is, is, of the moral guide. It also again breaks the consensus with other um, common conservative uh, strategies like breaking with the consensus. Not very pragmatic in the way of making coalitions with the other party or making concessions, rather very rigid in its stance saying we are at the border of two worlds. We have to choose. And lastly, um, for what I mentioned, again, going into the economics of this party uh, and, and uh, their ideology as it projects onto economics, once again, very op opposite of the left, rejection of neoliberal ideas, rejection of the free market, although understanding the free market, but wary of its detrimental effect since it's polarizing to society uh, that could be uh, creating stability. So now going, dwelling more into this um, economics. <laughs> Politics uh, is prior to economics because the state could use economics to, as a tool for, um, for, the, for greater good, for prosperity. Like I said, they could ready to use the state as a direct instrument of general welfare. It was strongly pushed by the party 
to secure a social network to pr uh, protect the losers of the transition. This is uh, very much reflected in Orban's speech. Our thoughts can be encapsulated in the concept of protected society in contrast with the concept of an open society. And I cannot help but hear the echoes of we are the vanguard of the people and we will protect you and lead you because you yourself, by yourself, in a window, a productive member of society with a job in this free market will not be able to protect yourself from the negative detrimental effects of the free market. Um, which I cannot consolidate the two in my head. Um, why you would need a large state apparatus to um, help you cushion the negative effect of, uh, of the market. And I see this is a uh, root of a lot of the problems. Today, um, as this economic tool like pension payments could be used as kind of like a crowd control if there is any kind of dissatisfaction. Here is two months of pension payments, or here is 10% off of your nationalized utilities from the nationalized uh, companies and so please kindly sit down <laughs> and be with your two months of pension payments. Um, so I see this not as an ideological revelation that it should be that way to protect the people but I see it more asleep as a tool um, used as a political tool. The way I envision this, like I said, I cannot, cannot consolidate this in my head and the way I visualize this is with the army curve where you have um, on the bottom government spending, and on the top, economic uh, freedom and, and economic growth. Where on the left side of the curve, what to you, your right side of the curve, where there is incredible government spending that would be like a Soviet Union era, uh, a country where all of the oxygen is taken up by the space, all the government spending and no private sector. Where the state, the bureaucracy is so large that, co that corruption is very likely and the entanglement of bureaucracy is just impossible to get through. On the left side of the graph would be the exact op opposite with less infrastructure. Maybe a state like Afghanistan where rule of law is not as secure. And then the optimum would something like our society be where if you buy a car you get a title. Where if you have an invention you have um, individual int intellectual property you can trademark it. If you open a business, it will not be nationalized from one day to another. Therefore, you're confident, you want to be a part of society, you want to innovate, you want to have these networks. However, if you have, you need a large state apparatus to protect you from these harsh economic effects, you will find yourself mostly on the right side of the graph as opposed to in the optimum that should by naturally develop. There's only one exception really to this. If your institutions are impeccable, really wonderful, um, maybe anything close to Scandinavian countries in the past who have been able to make bureaucracy a breeze or e-bureaucracy. But as you will see in this next slide, the effectiveness, effectiveness of Hungarian institutions are not very great, showing actually it is the government apparatus that has the negative economic impact on growth and not free market elements. You see something like regulatory quality or days to start a business. Um, sorry, this is might be unclear, but the yellow dots, there's a lot of countries on those spots, but the yellow dots, the yellow highlighted ones are where Hungary stands among other nations. So as I point out, days to start a business, um, th that's not a negative economic, a detrimental free, um, free market economic impact. That is the state. So going back to this, if you also have an issue consolidating these ideas in your head, that is because what we see here is the traditional roles have been reversed. Left wing of the political spectrum has supported right wing economic policies, whereas the political right has committed to left wing political, uh, left wing economic approach. Well, this is not necessary. Yes, okay. So, what is the political space that Fidesz occupies today? Um, it is a guiding state which is uh, met with favorable response by the people who are accustomed to being provided by the state. It has the task of guiding this transitional state but also being under pressure from global governments from the top. It has still the context of a legacy of, of, the, of communism, post-communist structure. And it needs to co consolidate modernization, mobilization of the people who feel disenfranchised and disillusioned, preservation of the party, and still staying in authority, being re-elected. So moving, uh, lastly, some contributing factors uh, into today's political environment and political arena. 
It was just, there's no viable opposition to Czech Fidesz. There's no real left. It has an identity crisis. You have socialists and you have liberals trying to find a coalition who still are trying to deal with their shameful past and some criminal past of maintaining an authoritarian regime. Their early electoral victory, which kind of made them ambivalent. And not having really answers being offered other than tagging on complete opposites. Uh, titles to create more polarization saying they're the liberal progressive left of you know showing uh, European integration while the opposite must be against integration which in my opinion makes European integration the question a lot harder because now you made it a domestic political issue you made it uh, we're on this side you're on that side as opposed to really tackling the European integration issue the cultural issue the economic uh, and, and a lot of those entanglements, you cannot really just make it a domestic issue like you would with any other question. And let's see what I would like to spend time on is the failure of uh, transitional justice, which um, really was used primarily as a political manipulation. There was re really no honest confrontation with the past, no real punishment uh, for those who maintain the authoritarian regime or, or any, any sort of other realization or confrontation with the past. It was either ret retroactive criminal investigation or screening based on the Sriga police files, which are still not open to the public. They may have been selectively open to target certain individuals, but it's not open to the public, which, as I understand, is an issue in, in many other post-communist uh, satellite states where they really should burn it or open it all or what they should do with it. Which is why a lot of former agents of the Hungarian Secret Service have never gone through a screening and many of them in leadership positions. So, like I said, why does it fail? Why there, was there no transitional justice that could also bring in people um, and create this kind of reciprocity uh, between the people and the government, this social contract that should be there? That is not because there was no real facing of the past or, or, or consequences of justice. Well, one, it was used by the administration to divert attention away from the mismanaged privatization, often um, real estate, industry, wealth, capital, missing, mismanaged, ending up in another friend's pocket because um, there was this witch hunt because a police file was opened and somebody was being investigated. So that's another um, misuse of, of, of traditional justice or using it to blackmail a party, an opposition, or somebody from your own party who was just a little bit an outlier. So again, completely taken advantage of. And honestly, people just became exhausted and lost interest because it's just too much witch hunt at this point. What they really cared about, who were actually imprisoned or tortured during this time, were more retroactive criminal justice for themselves. And once it was given to individuals, that the need for justice, I don't want to say, uh, revenge, but more justice for themselves is kind of calmed down. So an overall open, opening of the secret police files never happened, which erodes norm of generalized reciprocity and trust. These are the intangible elements of uh, a democracy, a participatory democracy, not just showing up to vote, but, but the intangibles that kind of would create um, the, the population that would oppose some of these extreme measures or be more politically or civically engaged or not so disenfranchised, this, this reciprocity and trust between the state and the people. And yes, that's my assessment. <laughs>